He's good at plugging. Yeah, you're great. Let's call him the big plugger. <laughs> call Brittany. <laughs> call Brittany. <laughs> There's a butt plug joke in there, there somewhere. There was. I almost, I almost. I was trying to figure out. I, was right I could there. come up with a good way to do it. No, I, but we didn't quite. Might get as well there. hit the babe. John, John's going to edit this part out too. <laughs> yeah, probably. But he'll save it for the gag reels. <laughs> House rules. Uh-huh. Oh. First of all, take your shoes off at the door and leave them in the foyer. Oh, shit. <laughs> oh, God. It's a house rule. So I don't think people even have to consciously think, we're going to play D&D. What are our house rules going to be? They're they organic. will evolve over time. Like, Do you want to know what my favorite house rule of yours is? That's eventually what this conversation is all going to be about. So <laughs> why don't you jump right in? I have two. It? Yeah. One is that uh, health potions just do. I have to check that off the list of things <laughs> I was going to talk about. <laughs> health potions just do the max. I loved that one. To me, because it's like, if I'm spending all this gold on a health potion, I it better fucking work. <laughs> I was thinking about this earlier today, you know, when I was thinking, what would I talk about during this particular <laughs> segment? <laughs> yeah. Your standard health potion. 2D4 plus 2. Yeah. 50 gold pieces. Standard health potion, 2D4 plus 2, is really going to help what? Stave off death. (laughs) Level 1, 2 characters. 50 gold pieces can be a fortune at that era, right? So that is a lot to spend on them. And then the prices just skyrocket as you get to greater Greater and superior. So 50 gold pieces. I spend 50 gold pieces as a first level guy. You spend 50 gold pieces as a first level guy. You roll your dice, you get 10 hit points out of it. That essentially probably got you back up to full. Or close, yeah. I do the same thing. I get four out of it. You're still nearly dead. (laughs) I still spent 50 freaking gold pieces for it. So I just decided in my world that the quality control mechanism had been been in place. So the production of health potions had been, hey, they put six sigma in this. They got the two standard deviations for the mean. They had a 99.8% quality efficiency rating. So if you buy a, a standard health potion, it's 10. Yeah. You drink it, you will that. get ten points back. It's because it, it's it's fair for the players, and two, the amount of times we're like, wait, how much? How many dice is that? Uh, like, and having to ask, you know, somebody how many dice it is. How it was just ridiculous. We just knew it said health potion, ten health. Like that was it. That's all you needed, <laughs> and it made it so much simple. I love that rule. The other one I love is I yes for now, but I reserve the right to change my mind later. <laughs> so we've talked about this before, yeah. but but. And it's nice to not sit there spinning wheels for three hours while you look something up in a book. Remember the early days? Yeah. yeah. Oh, we had some. We had especially yeah. in three point five. Oh yeah. We had some full-on courtroom proceedings. Right, where <laughs> two it. people have a book, but no, on this page. <laughs> You're about to hear about the dolphin story. I'm not going to talk about the dolphin story. <laughs> okay. You brought it up, now they're curious, but we're not going to talk about it because John's going to be an ass about it. But if you go back and look at some of our video on demand, you'll it's find there. multiple references to the <laughs> dolphin know, story. Right. Watch all of our content. Someday you'll, you'll understand. <laughs> and you'll learn about neck armor. <laughs> neck armor? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I still like the house rule of giving a feat before first level, even though it's not technically a house rule anymore because Tasha's has kind of... Yeah. But we've been doing it a lot longer. Backdoored it. The thing about Tasha's, <laughs> I'm a good plugger. I'm a good plugger for Tasha's back door. <laughs> There's the it's butt plug joke. Back there. <laughs> Tasha's makes it pretty clear. They give these alternate feats or features, and and it says in there, you know, you should you have to discuss this with your DM whether you can take this instead of the feature that's offered or the feats. And then they have there's people have come out with. Uh, they're racially based feats, right? So prerequisite to this one is being an elf, uh, or that will you know. go. Um, so we started that when I know I was 3.5. doing it at the beginning of the Wild Mount campaign. I think we had done it a few times in three point five as well. I think we did in three point five. I know our first five E campaign was Salt Marsh, mm-hmm. and about an about a session or two in. <laughs> 
<laughs> Finish your thought, and then I will regale them with the dolphin story. <laughs> I read a, uh, what is it, the the magazine article? Dragon. Ra- with the wizards on un- Unearth Arcana? Unearth, Unearth Arcana. Arcana mm-hmm. yeah. Right, and it, and it had a list of these, you know, other feats that they were going to help me out here, John. Unearth Arcana is kind of where they do trial runs and stuff, right? Yeah, they throw it out testing. there, let the world tell them what they thought about it, and then it might make it into a book. Right. Yeah, and so I read through that list and I found one for each of you. You guys remember I wrote them on like little, little blue three point five yeah. cards and I handed them out. It was just a boon. Here, you now have this feet. You now have that feet. You now have that feet. And that you guys are still first level when I did that. I think you were pretty close. If not, it, it may have been second level, but it was re- I right feel at the like beginning. It was first. Uh, and I just thought that was cool to give you guys something that was individualized and, and kind useful. of specific and useful and then you did it with wild mount i did um and some of those were homebrewed feats aren't they they pretty much all were all yeah them, all homebrewed. a little bit homebrewed some of them were pretty similar to other feats and i think hannah doubled up on hers but so the dolphin story the dolphin story by popular demand i by was peer playing pressure. A Venara Shaman, which Venara is the monkey man race from 3.5, and Shaman was pretty similar to Druid in that they had wild shape, animal companions, and magic. There was one encounter with Emily here DMing, and you can see her enthusiasm. It's already starting. The, the, uh, the awkwardness. Just begin the tension in our marriage. <laughs> <laughs> and I wanted to jump out of the water as a dolphin. And she was like, well, show me in the rules where it says you can do that. And I was like, well, okay. And I opened up the rule book and I scoured that rule book for like five minutes, index to page, index to page, looking for any sort of justification. Anything. There's a topic for a later one. Uh, Wizards of Coast indexing. Yeah, that is true. (laughs) But I could not find a goddamn thing. And so I immediately went into... John bullshitting his way through something. I was ass about this. In hindsight, I was 100% This is a change. This is a change. This is new. This is a change. And I apologize. But basically what it was is there was like a floating lady above this river and she was like 15 feet in the air and he wanted to launch himself out of the out of the water and go 15 feet in the air in an arc and smack this lady. I've seen dolphins do it. Well, and that's what I said. But here's my thing. I was like, show me where you have the power or the like, because like he had like it was not a deep river to get enough swim speed up to at, from a standstill. This is the way that whole conversation devolved, right? Yes. We got it, into the geometry. A dolphin flying through the air and at, knocking your lady off would have ruined the encounter. A dolphin would have been just brilliance for your character, yes. and so we were at this impasse, and it became questions about. Physics. <laughs> well, he had a piece of paper like, and was like drawing. Because we couldn't find anything in the book. So then we're like, well, would the physics allow it? Absolutely. Rule of cool, Beer Achilles. But, yeah, uh, I know. But you got to understand that living with John, sometimes you have to set limits or else he will absolutely just shit on you later. Because he will be like, you remember that one time you let me drop 15 feet in the air? Well, I took this feet. It's now going to let me drop three miles in the air. And there's nothing you can do about it. You have to set limitations with John occasionally. The reserving the right to change their minds later is... Was was not around at the time. <laughs> is pretty much because of me and our brother-in-law. My brother-in-law. And to be fair, because we are married... We tend to bicker more. Had somebody else spot it to me, I'd have been like, meh, maybe. But because John did, and he knows this, that I was like, no, that's fucking stupid. <laughs> Why are you trying to ruin my encounter? <laughs> God, John. Uh, so I apologize in retrospect because I was a little too harsh on you. But thank you for apologizing that you were, in fact, being a dick. <laughs> we have had a breakthrough moment here on Percentile Vice. I'd like to thank uh, Beercules and, and Joe for you know pushing the issue because you this was... You've improved the marriage. Thank this you. This was cathartic. We all needed to get through this. The <laughs> apologies been, have finally been spoken. It's been about seven years. It literally has. It, it, it comes up often. <laughs> Whenever, like... But this is... It's seven years. It's the first time there's been apologies issued. <laughs> <laughs> so, on this episode of Marital Therapy for John and Emily... <laughs> 
because shit, that's it. But yes, it, it was like, it is like the harken back of, you know, when when one of us wants to do something that there's no ruling for and there's nothing to be like, is it going to be another fucking dolphin? Like, But it does bring up a good point that will allow us to kind of slide this back on topic. Sorry. Right? The rule of sorry. cool is essentially a very uh, malleable and movable house rule. Yes. Right? What is allowed is rule of cool in different games. So anybody ought to have that part where, like, I'm not sure the rules exactly work that way, but that's going to be so, so badass. Bad. Let's do it, right? Yeah. The Eldritch ba- Blast shotgun. That was a cool one. Um, yeah. Oh, Eldritch Blast by the, she was a sorcerer? Yeah. No, she was a warlock. 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 Doing Eldritch game. Blast, a rogue with a bag full of uh, ball, ball bearings. bearings, tosses ball bearings into the air at the exact right moment for the Eldritch Blast to take them and... Help shoot them. them towards Eldrick shotgun. Just so cool, we did it. I probably underplayed the uh, the damage. I think I only gave like an extra one d four or something. Mm-hmm. Thinking back on it, it's probably worth more than that. Maybe a little, but we made it work. House yeah. rule. Right? I, I will admit that back in the day with the dolphin thing, we had not really explored the rule of cool, and I had really been you know was getting into learning how to DM, and I learned later that it, it's much more fun to let them do the cool shit than to fight with them about it and i got better as it was my first time like dming a large group so it was i got better i i I loosened up i'm not like a complete no she's not 3.5 is very chunky too it was it was pretty tough at times to figure out what actually has a rule and what actually doesn't and where rule of cool takes over and where the actual rule book takes over because yeah it was so advanced by the time we were playing it one of the house rules that i put in place that y'all virtually never used even though i thought it was the coolest thing ever was the i know a guy do you remember that i do and i have seen that in other places too and i've just always found it hard yeah to because it requires you to kind of do some adding to your backstory, right? So right. I always felt like I couldn't just pull it out. Like I had to be able to figure out a way to weave it all in. You know, okay, I was a street urchin and I lived in Baldur's right. Gate on the southern end. And so there was this tavern and that's where I knew the guy with the one eye and the peg leg right. that I need for right now. And so it time, was cool. It just it felt hard as a player to do it. Without being taking liberties with her, without breaking something. But when we did the I know a guy, which basically it was that my players could, if they, you know, thought that they may have known somebody in their past who could help them out with the situation, they'd be like, hey, I used to know this guy. And they could kind of give me a, a quick rundown of the guy and be like, he might know how to help us. And it was a way for them to help me create NPCs that could help them with problems that they felt stuck on. But we were doing it in 3.5. I think now in 5e, Or in Call of Cthulhu, it would be a better thing because we have much more fleshed out backstories. That plays in pretty well to what Joe just said. Don't you think some systems are easier to implement house rules than others? 100%. For me, I find it more difficult to adjust things on D&D because of rules and general limitations when it's about creating a scenario. I think Hero System is probably the easiest one to adjust everything properly in terms of rules improvisations. Improvisations. Yeah, no, 100%. There's certain things that it's just harder to make those on-the-call decisions. Like Cthulhu, I find it easier because we don't have super structured characters. Like, you have some skills, but, like... And the mechanics aren't super structured either. So there's a lot of play. You don't have... Well, first of all, they're all humans, right? At the back. Easy. But there's not, like... As you level up, you get new features. Each feature or feat has rules attached to them, and how do those work out, right? And, and so you it's, just get better at what you already know. Even going back to like the class, the class has so many rules and things attached to it that Call of Cthulhu it's easier because your occupation means you start out with these numbers here, and, and that's it. it, and that's it. And then you and the the game master keeper have to decide how that plays. Does electronics work in this situation yeah um and then so it's a lot easier to slip in rule of cool like it's a little bit of a stretch but it's gonna be really cool if you can just you know because you did that with like a navigate role and one of your characters you kept wanting to use like navigation of the skill and you kept <laughs> finding particular ways. session he was pulling every skill he had trying to get it in He's there like, so I'm he just could gonna get it beef in it there. up but go ahead john 
I was trying to use navigate in an Egyptian tomb because I was an archaeologist. It makes sense to me. And I, <laughs> I let you use it. Um, we were in an Egyptian tomb yeah. that had one long hallway that opened into a room yeah. that had two rooms off of it. And he wanted to well, navigate. I, navigate. I think that way is south. <laughs> I don't bring my player knowledge of Good point. it Good being point. one hallway into it. <laughs> way to keep yeah. the meta out of it, keep dude. Keep the meta out. Staying in character. Well done. Nice. Uh, but I like Cthulhu for that reason because it allows you to kind of bend those rules a little bit. Like, like I know this is an archaeology, but hear me out on anthropology. <laughs> you know, it gives me that opportunity. Whereas in in Dungeons and Dragons, it's very you know, this is that skill that is what you use, and if you don't have good numbers and dexterity, you're just kind of fucked. And I read something recently about ways you can get that kind of thinking into your D and D games, right? So, for instance, like medicine check. Right, it's give me a wisdom medicine check. Mm -hmm. This point was that it's even said in the book you can you can make checks based on different abilities. You could make an argument that this particular medicine check should apply more to intelligence than wisdom. If you convince the GM, then rule a cool. Then you could say, all right, well, make me an uh, intelligence medicine check. So you're making the medicine check. If you're proficient in it, you're going to get your proficiency bonus, but you're going to apply the intelligence bonus instead of the wisdom bonus to it. Um, I agree with that. I, I do too. I just, we never, it's hard to find or think to find places for that kind of stuff. And it's yeah. hard when you're starting out to ask for it, be yeah. like, hey, this intimidate, can I just flex on them instead of... Can I use my strength and like and break use something? my strength instead of... <laughs> Doing yeah. charisma because you know you haven't got that far yet, and you don't know that's how it should work. But you've you've made a couple of videos that talk about that kind of stuff of how skills may align themselves better to other things. So that's that, and that's a really good video. You fleshed that out really well and talked about a lot of different stuff in there. So y'all should definitely check that out if you have more about that. That's also on Malaris Weapon Channel, and now that you've uh, subscribed and notified, you, you can, can check the it. back inventory there. And yeah, find that. You're so good at plugging. So I'm a plugger. I'm a plugger. What can I say? <laughs>